So today we've got the world expert in my eyes on EMFs. He's called the EMF guy because he's been seen in many, many different health circles as the true health pioneer. He's fighting a huge, incredible fight against the telecommunications industry. And I'm joining his army because I really believe that this area of health is fundamental with regards to people thriving. We've got Nick Pinot on the show. Welcome to the Made to Thrive show, Nick. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me, Steve. I just want to mention to be a humble a little bit. I've just started this work basically four years ago with my book, and I'm I'm standing with giants behind me, which is really hundreds of scientists uh, and other EMF activists and uh, educators that really stand behind me. What I did with my book and with my work is really to try to sum it up and translate it into words that make sense for people. But yes, if you consider me an EMF expert, that's okay. But I want to say I'm not alone and I'm really part of this huge community of people who want safe technologies. Great. Uh, a very humble man, Nick, is. I've already started with his uh, EMF online course, his initial course, and he's got an update on that. And it's an incredible sort of just vast amount of knowledge and uh, I've learned a lot myself. I am a certified geobiologist, geovite as my community knows, but what an incredible combination with Brian Hoyer from Shielded Healing and he's put on an incredible course and they're updating it at the end of the month which we'll talk about. But I want to start off with a very stratosphere view on what non-native electromagnetic fields and ask you and, and paint a sort of a picture for you Nick. If you were the president, if you had unlimited funds, if you could wave a wand and change the entire globe, what would you be doing about non-native electromagnetic fields to improve health, wellness, and just the general population overall? I love it. No one is asking me this question. So I, yeah, I'm going to take it away. Okay. So electromagnetic fields, you know, they're, they're everywhere. That's an entire spectrum of things that can be called, or that can be called part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Anything from household electricity that is a very low frequency, 50, 60 hertz, depending on where you happen to be in the world, up to uh, nuclear radiation is also part of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. And in the middle somewhere, we have visible light and we have uh, a little bit uh, further down in a little bit lower frequencies, we have cell phones and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So all of these are electromagnetic fields. There are electromagnetic fields that, let's say, are native. So we have been evolving with these frequencies. And these include, of course, the uh, Schumann resonance, uh, different levels of uh, natural earth frequencies, whether it's uh, uh, different sorts of geopathic stress or beneficial frequencies that come from the earth and in uh, the earth's natural magnetism that is a, a DC current that can be, uh, you can even get it that um, thousands of uh, f uh, foot in altitude and also uh, various aspects of light of course so the sunlight whether it's the sun rays that we see the visible spectrum or the invisible spectrum including certain types of infrared and uv and w life has co-evolved with these frequencies but new frequencies have been uh, introduced to our environment starting in 1750, where the first experiments with static electricity have been made. And that's well referenced in, I'll, I guess I can mention my book, The non Tinfoil Guide to yeah, EMFs, just absolutely. to be fair for myself. But uh, I, I, I summarize EMFs, they, their dangers and what to do about it. But a brilliant book as well is from Arthur Furstenberg. And he, he, he went into, that's called The Invisible Rainbow. And that's a great read because he goes into depth uh, about the history of electricity. So he goes at the beginning when people started uh, experimenting with these uh, small electrical shocks, uh, really static shocks that are, they contain so little electricity. They're, it, it's, it's minute compared to just being exposed to just being in a room right now in a building where there is electricity in the walls, uh, these electrical fields. So it was a, really a minute fraction, maybe a millionth of the levels of exposure we have at the moment. And yet some people were doing okay with static electricity. Uh, some people were getting healed and uh, it started the, an entire medical profession around using static electricity to heal people. Um, there were 
it was kind of a miss, a hit or miss approach in these years. Of course, 1750, the medical community wasn't so miraculous and still a lot of uh, beliefs were really not okay. I don't know if they, they remove people blood to, to, to ail them from, uh, to, to cure them from different ail- ailments and different things. But at, at one point they realized also these practitioners who use static electricity that some people were getting sick before, because they were getting shocked too much. And we're talking about levels of electricity that are so small, it's, it's not even the equivalent of a battery. But over time, some people got hypersensitive to this static electricity and felt fatigue or restless or hormonal changes. Really, it was too much stress on their biology. And we know for a fact that in nature, you use these levels of electricity or even lower in the picovolts, like it's um, probably a, a billionth of a volt, or uh, I don't know the exact figure, sorry to not be technical enough for, uh, for that, I don't have it in front of me, but very minute amount of electricity made a difference, for example, on plant growth or stunt growth in certain situations. So we know that all of nature, all of biology, including bacteria, including plants, animals, fungi, human beings also were affected by minute levels of electricity. So fast forward, we're in 2020. Now we're exposed to many other types of, let's say, non-native EMFs. And this really, I use the term these days, electropollution, to make people understand that, you know, it's it's a new type of pollution that we need to be aware of. And pretty much everyone you ask in the street would be... Uh, I mean, no one is really in denial that smog is bad and that air pollution is not good. Some people could say, well, it's not a big deal in my city. Okay, fine. But when they see these levels of smogs in Chinese city, or even in Montreal or even New York City or even, uh, I mean, some uh, cities in India, it's it's really hard to breathe. And it represents uh, millions and millions of deaths worldwide just from smog. Uh, we know it's a problem. It is a global problem. Well, electropollution, it's a mounting problem because we're exposing ourselves to all these new frequencies. Uh, you know, in, in, the, in the range, in the frequency range of one gigahertz, let's say that's the, the, average, the average cell phone signal around the world, our exposure has increased over the last 100 years by a quintillion times. So that's a billion billions times 15 uh, 15 zeros after the one basically in increase in that electropollution in the one gigahertz range so some people argue well you know we've always been living with this radiation and microwave radiation in that range we do get it from space a little bit and that's part of the reason astronomers are able to figure out uh, distance of planets and composition, some of it is the type of EMFs that is being uh, emitted or reflected off of a planet's surface, the way I understand it. And I'm not <laughs> a big space guy, but that's part of what I understand from space. So it, it's part of the spectrum is super important in astronomy. But right now, we're, we've polluted that spectrum at levels that are really unprecedented in nature. And now it leads us to the big question and the big debate of our time is, well, since electricity uh, has always affected us at very low levels, and even that in the medical community was controversial at the time in the 1750s and is still controversial to this very day, whether it actually impacts us or not. You've got an entire industry now, uh, multiple industries, whether it's people who create gadgets and iPhones and, well, whether it's, I don't want to bash on Apple, it's all the phone manufacturers equally that want to produce phones. Then you've got the telecoms who want to put up cell phone towers and want users to pay a monthly fee and make a lot of money. It's a huge industry. The tech industry and the telecom industry together, they represent an industry that is said to be bigger than big pharma as far as profit goes. You can imagine how much reach they have when it comes to corporate influence on how they don't want regulations to change. And that's the part where people say, well, it's a conspiracy theory and these things. But I think we've really, people who dangle that, that uh, conspiracy theory idea really forget that it doesn't have to go uh, as far as conspiracy theory and speculation. We can look at 
study outcomes versus uh, study funding, for example. And very quickly, you discover that when it's funded by governments, by the military, or by telecoms, and the government is in it also for the money because they sell spectrum to the telcos. So unfortunately, they have a huge bias towards no effect. Well, all these studies mostly show no effect. When you have independent science, and there's little of it because no one wants to fund it, you have large effects or effects that are present. So the, the EMF science is slowly evolving, but at, at a rhythm that is so slow compared to how fast our technology is increasing and how fast the electropollution is increasing, that is a big concern. So that's why, for example, the independent scientists who study that stuff, study EMFs, there are several hundreds of them. There's more than 300 of them that have signed different appeals uh, in in the last several years, several two decades. There's been 10, 15 different appeals where they band together, they try to have a common message. And the common message is this. It's not to stop using cell phones to, tomorrow morning or any of that stuff. It's to start preventatively reducing electropollution instead of increasing it. And that's where 5G comes in, right? 5G, fifth generation of signals. That's the next generation that's coming. And uh, it's been so much in the news this year. And a lot of people are concerned about 5G, sometimes forgetting that there are other generations before. There's 4G, 4G, 4 generation, third generation, two generations, and and, and so forth. And there's Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and other sources of electropollution, including household electricity. And all of these matter. Uh, So I guess the 5G debate is a little bit over the top. But the reason it's important, though, and it's, it's valid is simply we're rolling a technology that's going to require so many so many more cell phone towers around the world that it's really we're uh, to quote a scientist dr martin paul from the washington state university he said uh, um, multiple times in interviews we're running as fast as we can in the wrong direction as far as electropollution goes whereas with air pollution well it's been it's so bad it's killing so many people that i mean China has become one of the greenest countries in the sense that they're not green yet, but they have developed the best technologies to clean up their factories, for example, or to create uh, zero to little emission uh, manufacturing processes. So that's super important. But at the moment, telecoms are not incentivized to create lower radiation technologies. So... If I can pause there, or I can go into what I, I would do about uh, it. Yeah, no, let's just uh, deconstruct and distill that. There's a lot of information there. I do yeah. want to get in the practical sense. We are going to, you know, delve a bit deeper into the details in that. But if you were the president, or you were Elon Musk with all the money in the world, what would you do? I would incentivize people to use wired connections more often than not. Um, I would put mandatory Ethernet ports. Ethernet is simply the port that you use to connect to the Internet, to connect to a router, for example, from a computer to a router. Sometimes you need a conversion like USB-C to Ethernet and then Ethernet to Ethernet to your, to your router, just to be clear. So um, I, w- I, w- I would have that in all coffee shops. I would have that on bench parks. I would have that uh, in especially public buildings, uh, subway stations and whatnot. So if you're there, for a while and you're waiting and you want to download that HD movie that takes several gigs, you can do so in a split second with fiber, which is the technology where the information travels via light speed. It, it's light inside a tube. Uh, so it, it can reach, in reality, fiber is millions, if not more times faster than 5G. So it's never going to be beat this technology by wireless because everything travels faster inside a technology, inside a tube or a technology that's designed to pass information super fast. And and I, I would do that first because our reliance on wireless is way too much uh, at the moment. And if I'm in a coffee shop and I ask for an Ethernet cable, they don't even know what it is, right? So it's out of our of our cultural um, reality at the moment of using Ethernet cables and wired uh, internet. 
I would mandate it in new constructions in all homes, for example, also. So install it. And let's say you have an office environment. I'm in my bedroom, but that's in fact my bedroom slash office. So in the, this, this office space, I did, have to, I, I did have to run an Ethernet cable to this place. But if it were mandatory to have it on near all outlets, I would simply plug it in and call it a day. And this computer, I don't move it around the home. I never, I'm never in my, in my kitchen. My two-year-old would be playing with it or so if i i'm stationary there's really no reason whatsoever to be on wi-fi and bonus because in fact my cable is super stable and very fast whereas my wi-fi connection was very poor and the connectivity was uh was dropping all the time when we uh, first uh, came into this home three years ago and it was so bad i couldn't even do a zoom call like we're doing right now so it was it was very frustrating and um, the, the solution, the wireless solution to that would have been to have an even stronger Wi-Fi router filling my entire home with electropollution that is sometimes useful but mostly useless because maybe I use my computer four hours in the morning or maybe six hours, but the 18 other hours, I would be exposing the entire family to a signal that's stressful for nothing because most people let their Wi-Fi router just be and they don't think twice about it. So that's a problem. Our reliance are wireless. The second thing is another avenue that's a bit tricky, but some engineers think we can make Wi-Fi safer or all types of uh, wireless signals safer. That's probably valid because, you know, there are certain frequencies that are more harmful or more stressful to biology than others, but we're really at the very infancy uh, of that research, unfortunately. And I'm, I'm trying as an advocate for safe, te- for safe technologies to kind of highlight that on my podcast, Smarter Tech, and try to interview people who may Maybe know what's coming down the the technological pipe and some people are looking into that but at the moment there's no incentive for companies there's no money to be made on safer tech uh, because users don't demand it so if um, i've seen one there's a few of them a few cell phones that are let's say lower emf that are coming uh, one of them is mudita pure from the company mudita that is a polish startup that uh, is really health focused. So it's a cell phone company that's health focused. Bizarrely, they tell users, use your cell phone less and stay on airplane mode, for example, which is tremendous. At least there's progress. But you know, the CEO of that company himself got sick at one point because of his EMF exposure and realized he was very sensitive to these signals. And now he's getting better. And that's why you launched a company. So oftentimes, unfortunately, we have to get to this point where we experience it ourselves, we get sick, and then we do something about it. My message is, well, okay, that Safer Wi-Fi is really far, I think, in the future. I hope it's gonna. I hope that we. I will be able to hasten it, along with so many scientists and engineers and people who are concerned about the dangers of, of this technology. But in the meantime, well, what are you to do? Well, I still use a cell phone. I still use Wi-Fi very occasionally, but strategically. And this is where kind of the course comes on, and is. How can you do it at home? How can you minimize your exposure to all sources of electropollution, uh, but while still having technology and not necessarily going back to to the forest? It's not. It's nothing like that. I'm in a city. I use a cell phone sparingly. I use my computer very frequently. I'm an author. I'm a writer. I write. I write in front of a computer at least four to five hours a day, but. You know, Ethernet cables right there, I'm cutting my exposure so much compared to the average person that's always working on Wi-Fi. And what most people don't realize is, yes, the Wi-Fi router is an important source and the cell phone is an important source, but also this computer in front of me is an emitter. It emits Wi-Fi and it receives Wi-Fi back. So I'm basically a foot and a half from this Wi-Fi emitter. So it's a big exposure in someone's life. So... Looking at the science we have about how EMFs might be a class 2B um, a possible carcinogen, how more science is coming that shows effects on all sorts of, of health effects so much that the scientists studying that stuff say we should preventatively reduce these levels, I say, well, at the moment, we're not in a spot where we should 
um, freak out about it so much that we lose sleep, but we should preventatively minimize our exposure as much as we can. And you know, the surprising thing that I discovered after publishing my book 2017 is that even very healthy people who do that, uh, for example, turn off the Wi-Fi at night, remove the cell phone, and uh, maybe turn off the circuit breakers to reduce their exposure to electric fields. And they do basic steps. Oftentimes, these steps are just a change of habit, not even an investment of any amount of dollars. And they sleep better. They feel less stressed. They, they realize I have more energy. And they realize that uh, this electropollution has been draining them kind of behind the scenes. So it's, it's, it was surprising to me because I, I thought, well, maybe some individuals are very sensitive and the others won't feel a difference. But so far, I have yet to find um, not one person, but it, there's not a lot of people who tell me they haven't felt a difference when they minimize it, especially during the night where it seems our body really wants to switch to that rest and digest mode, that parasympathetic system. And maybe EMFs are part of the reason that you know we're sending all these signals. And just like it is the case with light, uh, too much blue light or the wrong spectrum at night can be very stimulating and really shifts our circadian rhythm or our ability to get into the right the right state of mind and state of your nervous system at night. Well, probably electropollution acts in the same way. So right. that's what I would do um, to summarize more 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 wired and then hopefully we can make wireless a little bit safer. And in the meantime, you minimize your exposure to all sources. Give us a few more sort of details on how to use a cell phone, because I think everybody's got a cell phone listening to this. And I know that uh, distance is your friend. And I keep my cell phone mainly on airplane mode. I've hardly got it on. I'd rather not uh, let the cell phone tower, you know, get my phone to receive that signal. I'd rather be, mm -hmm. you know, trying to connect it via Wi-Fi rather than the cell phone. But keeping it in your pocket. I mean, it just seems quite freakish. I've done a lot of videos on, you know, electro pollution, the effects of it. And people are, you know, South Africa may be very conservative in sort of their knowledge of electromagnetic radiation. What should mm -hmm. people be doing with their cell phones? It's really creating distance. You've said it well, because if we're talking about very concrete dangers to your health, I can tell you the, the, the biggest concern when it comes to how, literally deadly a cell phone can be would be using it next to your head for several hours every day. We know that this behavior for a segment of these heavy users who use their cell phone two to four hours every day, there's some who developed acoustic neuromas leading to complications or even worse is the glioblastomas, uh, basically the worst type of brain tumor yeah. you can ever get. And some people die in a very short manner. It's it's So that's that's the immediate danger. However, all sorts of other dangers do exist to other body parts, but the science behind uh, those links is weaker because we don't have them. But there are some science around keeping a cell phone too close to your thyroid gland, for example. So again, talking next to the head, thyroid cancer. Some women have been found to have uh, at least plausible links between uh, keeping a cell phone in the bra or in, you know, in a sports bra, they go jogging and maybe they'll listen to, to Spotify or something like that, but they keep it out of airplane mode and the stream instead of pre-downloading the songs or uh, pre-downloading podcasts, for example, and then going running. You can have the same behavior, but just do one change and you remove all that radiation, but there are some links with breast cancer and breast tumors where where uh, where women kept their cell phone for hours and hours every day uh, connected via the internet. There's also concerning links that are increasing as far as cancers of the the pelvic region, all sorts of cancers, uh, testicular cancer, uh, colon cancer, prostate cancer, ovarian cancer, and the links there are weak, but. They're plausible as well, because if we know it causes cancer next to the head, if you keep it on all day, well, what does it do if the average person keeps it between their leg as they're maybe in the car or they keep it in their pocket? And we do know for a fact that uh, the fertility of men drops if they expose themselves to these signals. And it, it's very plausible because in, 
I mean, sper- spermatozoa are, are very, very delicate. And the good news for men is that they can ga- gain back their fertility with dietary changes. I mean, biohacking as a whole, you can do a lot of things to biohack your fertility. But re- removing that cell phone signal also seems to be a big step. And some fertility clinics uh, went so far as to recommend uh, men to remove the cell phone from the pocket, even though some scientists could say, well, the link is not definitive, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's just a change of habit. So it's not like you're investing a lot of money or you're taking a big risk by removing your cell phone from your pocket. Mm -hmm. So the the main thing I would do is, is just say, well, if it's touching your body or any way, in any way during the day or at night, it needs to be on airplane mode. So that's that's hard to do for some people, but it requires just a change of habit. If you're talking on a cell phone, use earbuds or use speakerphone if you're alone. If you're on a subway train, not so much because it's a little bit annoying. Some people do that, but use earbuds to be respectful of uh, this <laughs> everyone's in society. Some people are very loud with it. Yeah. If you put it in your pocket, Well, put it on airplane mode temporarily if you can do it. Uh, If you can't, well, you you do do what you can manage to do. But if, like most people, you're at work, you can put your cell phone on airplane mode and then have it um, automatically set that if your cell phone cannot be reached, it rings on your landline. Well, in that case, you're eliminating the cell phone during the day. And if you need to be called on your cell phone, well, just keep it in front of you. Keep it one, two feet uh, in front of you so you can see it, so you can hear it. But it's not in your pocket, on your person, uh, or right next to your person all day. And you know the, the, the intensity of that radiation drops off exponentially when you create distance. So at two feet, you're already 90% in reduction of the strength of that electromagnetic field. So that's something that's very, very important. And these changes uh, will reduce your exposure tremendously. And then the last thing I'm gonna say is at night, please do not put it under your pillow. Do not fall asleep with your cell phone in your face. Some people do that kind of, well, look, just looking at a cell phone, right? You, you wear the, these, uh, these blue blockers, of course, red, red glasses. I wear them at night all the time. So just looking at the cell phone itself is a bad habit. It's going to keep you stimulated. Use the blue blockers, sure, but the signal itself yeah. could be stimulating. And then if you forget to put it on airplane mode, well, you have, again, a source of electropollution that can ping every couple of seconds, especially if you're a very active user. And let's say everyone, someone is texting you, everyone, you're, every, every time that your cell phone wakes up for a notification or maybe because emails are downloaded, well, the radiation goes through the roof and it's exposing you at night. So maybe you toss and turn and you don't really think twice about it, but this thing, your cell phone, is a source of disruptive signal for that's going to just hinder your normal sleep so if you want to fix that well airplane mode and if you you don't want to do that put it as far away as possible in the room or you may again grab a get a landline if these are still available in your country or area and make sure that your cell phone is redirected to that landline at night maybe if you have kids and you're uh, they're teenagers and that's that's something a lot of parents tell me i don't want to turn off my cell phone well just make sure it's not right next to you you can put it uh, i don't know i could put it in my office right here i would be 6 to 7 7, uh, seven foot away from uh, my my bed, so it wouldn't be that much of a big deal compared to if it's right underneath my pillow, like a lot of people unfortunately do. Sure, uh, thank you for that, and and I think that message is so important. My question to you is, why do not any people really know about it? I mean, I speak about it; it sounds so foreign. Doctors aren't aware of it. We are a very conservative country, but no one knows what you've just said. And in fact, if you do mention it, people are very touchy about their phones. They're very sort of connected to their phones. They're addicted to seeing these phones and being on social media and getting the likes and a lot of neurotransmitters are released like dopamine when they see a message or they connect to their Mm -hmm. social media network. It just sounds too far-fetched to to change people's habits. Now, how are we going to do this, Nick? It is difficult. Uh, There's multiple approaches that need to be to be put forward at the same time, I think activism is important, spreading the word, 
Uh, there are some people, some organizations like uh, 5GCrisis.com. Um, in 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 South Africa, I don't I don't remember exactly what organizations, but there's there's a few of them uh, that that are also fighting for safer regulations. You know, to lobby the government to it's 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 a fight of who's going to put the most money in front of the government to convince them that this is an issue. In certain countries, the issue has advanced more quickly than others. For example, in Russia, uh, of all places, lately they, they have put new regulations in place to completely remove Wi-Fi from school. Uh, but that's, a, that's an action step that has been taken in France, in nurseries, uh, in France, and also uh, for very, very young children. I think preschool, it's banned. Uh, in Israel, uh, there's... Uh, a maximum of allowed hours in primary school where you can have Wi-Fi on. So safer regulations already exist. So taking these countries that have taken that preventative action and uh, pointing to those as good examples to follow is an action step. But that's activism work that some scientists are doing, organizations, uh, lawyers, all sorts of people around the world, thousands and thousands of activists are trying to make it happen. On an individual basis, I think that if you change your habits yourself, it's going to impact other people. Um, it's 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 like, uh, well, wearing blue blockers. <laughs> I, I'm wearing them on the subway train. I'm yeah. the only guy with, with blue blockers. I have yet to meet a single person with blue blockers at night, except those who want to look cool. Maybe they're a designer or an artist or some something artistic, and they're kind of using orange glasses just be cool or to look like Bono or something. But uh, aside from that, I think I'm the, the only dude in Montreal out of 1 million people that has these. Well, eventually they're going to become more common and people are going to notice, well, what are these, these glasses? They kind of look cool or what is it for? They're going to be curious. So if you change yourself, if you help change maybe habits in your family and, and or maybe with your immediate friends, that's how we form new health trends also. I think that on an individual basis, if we start talking about electropollution, just with, like we talk about organic foods, about the importance of getting sunlight, I think that's also a movement that is extremely important in the biohacking space, among other, other places where we try to buzz the myth that sunlight is super dangerous and say, no, you need to get sun. Go get tanned and safe sun exposure is important. And vitamin D, vitamin D message this year has been getting there with the coronavirus and so many new papers showing protection effect against um, respiratory diseases, which I'm, I'm not surprised at all because vitamin D, I mean, some people have been hammering the message for 20 years, like Dr. Joseph Mercola or other pioneers that have been saying, look, the science is, is very, very important. You know, so to, so to advance the topic, I think it's what you do yourself on an individual basis, how much you're willing to spread the word. And what you do on an individual basis is also also will make a difference for industry. If more people buy safer cell phones, uh, maybe you buy more people buy Ethernet cables. Well, there's going to be more companies selling Ethernet cables. That's how it works. So if telecoms realize that there's money to be made with lower radiation levels, uh, they will jump on that opportunity. So it's also something to think about when you buy new products. If you buy Christmas gifts uh, in, in the next uh, few months and you see things that look cool, maybe uh, tech gadgets that have Bluetooth enabled technologies and that, that are going to really participate to that electropollution. Well, is there an alternative to that that doesn't have this option? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's a little bit less convenient, but it can be just, just as nice and you can get away with the, having the same functions with a wire. So it's always something to think about when you participate in buying Bluetooth headphones. Well, Yes, Bluetooth headphones would be cool. I would be the first to tell you that, but I would be exposing myself. How many hours per day am I listening to music while working? Like five hours? It would be five hours of an emitting device inside my ear. It's a very bad idea considering the science we have around cell phone and that the, the exposures could be equivalent. So if you decide not to buy Bluetooth headphones for this Christmas, you would make a difference. Because the Bluetooth devices market eventually, if people stop buying them or buy less of them, it's going to crumble a bit. And maybe manufacturers will say, wait a minute, people buy more wired. 
we're going to give you more options that are wired and then people buy more wires. That's how you reinforce a trend. So voting with your dollars is also very, very important when it comes to safe tech. Great. Uh, my view is it's going to take a few years for people to get really sick and for the young people to get really sick. And, you know, Naval Ravikant, uh, one of my heroes in terms of the VC world, said, suffering is the seed of change. And it just seems, unfortunately, that people have to suffer. Cancer has to grow exponentially even further. You know, the young children have to go through some significant pain and disease for people to possibly wake up and say, there's something wrong with the environment. But uh, I still think your activism, getting the message out, changing yourself, firstly, leading yourself, leading your close family, leading your close friends can have a significant impact. And then obviously health pioneers like yourself, you know, the Dietrich Klinghart of the world, the Joseph mm -hmm. McCullers of the world, you know, the Josh Trents of the world, there are people out there, the Luke Stories, the Tim Grays, we can yes. carry on and mention them you know, by name is we can stick together as a band of brothers or band of brothers and sisters to get the word out in terms of how damaging these fields are. I do want to just reiterate the word that Bluetooth devices, especially those that you just leave in your ears. You know, we go around and see people that just leave these Apple pods in their ears. The damaging effects of those hour in and hour out. Can you just expand on how bad Bluetooth is? Because I think people are totally unaware you know, they carry their cell phone in their yeah. pocket still on and then they got this Bluetooth device in their ear and they think that they're pretty safe. Well, exactly. It, it is controversial. If, if I say on this podcast, well, Bluetooth devices are dangerous or will cause cancer and all that, like I cannot make these claims. However, if we look at the cell phone science that shows if you're a heavy user and in certain definitions of the term, it can be as low as 30 minutes per day on a cell phone. God knows a lot of people that are in finance or PR or big business spend all their time on their cell phone or with a Bluetooth device instead that's just in their ear. And then you see users in the last three years is, is grown exponentially, like you said, that keep these, uh, these earbuds in their ear. And some of them all day, every day, even just as a, as a habit, almost as a cool looking accessory, even though they're not listening to anything active. But the Bluetooth uh, device, if it's still connected to your cell phone, it's always emitting and receiving information. Uh, if it's actively playing something is probably uh, emitting worse level of radiations, but there's always a signal that is continuous and that will also expose you even deeper inside your brain because proximity to your brain will make a difference. For example, if you distance your cell phone uh, 5 to 15 millimeters from your head, like they do in testing, you get very, very lower levels of radiation as far as your your the exposure to your head goes. So imagine what it's doing if you go 5 to 15 millimeters inside your head, completely the opposite. Well, it, it will increase your exposure tremendously. And some of these Bluetooth devices have lower power levels. That is true. However, it's closer to your brain. So looking at the science at the moment and the fact that we really lack studies in with Bluetooth technology in particular, there are a few, I think a few hundred of studies on Wi-Fi per se, which is very insufficient for a technology that's used by billions and billions of people worldwide and soon to be 8 billion. There's going to be Wi-Fi everywhere within a decade. I mean, even uh, in, in certain parts, certain very remote parts is going to be mainly cellular technology, but these guys are being exposed in the middle of the Sahara desert. Some, uh, some, uh, very, some native tribes have cell phones now because at least they can communicate and this is good for them, but they still need to be educated about not keeping it in their pocket or else, well, they're going to get the same problems as everyone else down the road. So Bluetooth is just the equivalent of a cell phone. It's not that different, to be, to be quite honest. And it, it, it needs to be considered uh, as concerning as uh, any device that is touching your body, basically. Mm. Great. Uh, now that we're on cell phones, because I think it's just such a you know, prevalent topic, tell me about sleeves or shields or air tubes from companies like Defender Shield. You know, these massive claims, they put stickers on the back of cell phones and 
Yeah. You know, we've tested these things independently. Some of them are just not, you know, at all reliable sort of devices. And people are trying to make a quick buck, you know, from these sort of shielding devices. Tell us your own opinion, you know, what you use, what can work, and, you know, where the science is at at shielding. It's tricky. I can tell you there's a, a severe lack of science or scientific agreement on what needs to be used on a cell phone to, or what could be used on a cell phone to make it safer. Um, generally speaking, what I hear from EMF scientists or building biology experts or EMF mitigation specialists like my, my colleague Brian, who is co, uh, co-teacher in, on my, in my course, is the fact that we don't know. <laughs> we don't know whether they work or not. And the, let, let's, let's make a difference between different things. You know, there are cases, uh, I can mention company, I don't, I don't mind. I mean, I use mm. a safe sleeve. I can tell you that. I use safe sleeve. I could use Defender Shield. That's something I would feel comfortable with. Do, do I believe in the efficacy that is going to protect me 100%? I think it, rem- it it remains in suspension, that question. I would want to see more science done, and I've been wanting to see more science done in years. Um, and I'm, in, in fact, going to participate in, in a possible project with a few EMF scientists to try to have an independent body of scientists look at different solutions like these. Uh, will this case really protect you? Does it, yeah. is it, reducing your your exposure i can i can say these look promising but it, there's also rp of sweden that is another company that uh has been quite impressive in how they did their science and independent testing but again is it is it giving users a false sense of security will they continue to expose themselves more because now they think their cell phone becomes safe it's always tricky if if you don't do the habits first and you put a case and then maybe uh yeah you use the case but sometimes you keep it open and it's in your pocket and it's it's an imperfect solution right so you need to keep in mind if you want to use these solutions that it still requires you to be um to be wary of your habits also. As far as the chips go and different technologies that claim to be protective in a way that is not initially measurable on an EMF meter. So in other words, it does not reduce the intensity of the of the electropollution, but it will change certain characteristics. They claim sometimes to harmonize the signal. So as if the signal that is quite erratic in this in, in electropollution compared to other uh, natural EMF. So it's it's all over the place. It's pulsating. It's polarized, so it's it's shaped in a 3D environment instead of being unpolarized like sunlight that is basically an EMF that is emitted in all directions. So there are a lot of different characteristics that make an EMF stressful to our biology and foreign and unrecognized by our, uh, on, by our biology on a cellular standpoint. Well, these technologies might change these characteristics and make the EMFs less stressful. The problem and, and why we, in fact, Brian and I decided in our course not to get into, into these solutions is, again, we, we cannot test these independently at the moment. We don't have the capacity to, to really assess, okay, well, how much of a difference is it doing? Is it protecting 5%? Is it reducing 59% of the stress, uh, the cellular stress effect of the ex- oxidative damage? Or is it improving people's sleep by 17%? We don't have a quantification on it. And we have pretty much like like, like you, Steve, the, the biohacking mindset where we want to make it more scientific and be able to compare uh, chip one versus sticker B or pendant C. And at the moment, we don't have this data. And it, it really... Uh, It's been a concern of mine for a while because I see some companies making extraordinary claims Mm -hmm. like, well, you put the sticker on your cell phone and now your cell phone becomes healing for you. And I've heard it's, it's, it's concerning to me because I, I say, well, okay, I hope that's true because if it's not true, 
you could even be liable for health effects if if it protects 50% and people still expose themselves and develop a tumor long term because the they use it so much that let's say your your sticker is not protective enough well you're in deep trouble and so is the user so i don't want to make these claims of 100% protection i don't think these claims uh, are are exactly what should be said on a scientific standpoint what i can say is that some people report feeling less stress when they use their cell phone and they have certain of these technologies installed. So I could say, for example, well, it does diminish EMF-related stress or symptoms, but I don't think we can say they're 100% protective. And that's really the difference we want to make is whether you use these, these technologies, these patching technologies that maybe make the signal less stressful, it, the truth remains that you need to reduce your exposure and and cut off the signal at the source. I wouldn't if, if there's a chip installed on your Wi-Fi router. Uh, I would rather see you uh, turn off the Wi-Fi router when not in use, especially mm. at night, rather than investing a hundred bucks on a chip. Because for me. I'm assured that you will cut down on your exposure at least eight hours per day. You know, whereas the chip, it might work, it might not work, and I'm not even sure. And I, I, there's 50 plus companies that have reached out to me, maybe maybe close to hundreds, uh, in, in the last uh, three four years. And each claims their technology is the ultimate thing. Mm-hmm. So I'm frustrated by the topic, and I'm not discounting all companies. To be perfectly honest, I don't want to say that. I'm not dogmatic about these technologies not working. I want to see better science done. And I think in 2021, I'll be leading some sort of project to create that scientific committee because users want to know which devices work and which don't. I want to know. And I want to know what claims could we make about these. Mm. And if the claims are well, it diminishes EMF-related stress or biological effects. Well, that's good enough for me. I'll install one on my cell phone. And maybe the the the, the very uh, few occasions where I use my cell phone to maybe I'm, I'm walking around in the city, I'm like, where? I'm lost again. So I'll look at my GPS and then turn it back off. Well, for that minute of exposure, I'll be safer. So that's that's really the difference I want to make be- between... Changing your habits, having a case or having a chip and changing the habits, we know it works. We know the EMF scientists, that's what they recommend. And we know this is deeply rooted in science. In other words, it's not going to harm your life to minimize your EMF exposure. And it, it might very plausibly improve your life and minimize the amount of stressful things you have. Uh, that that are impacting your your biology. Fantastic. Uh, I've been trying to get Dr. Dietrich Klingart on the show, and hopefully we'll get him on. But he's very very sort of adamant on the use of electromagnetic fields and radiation, mm-hmm. especially with children. You've got a two year old. I've got a sixteen year old and a four year old. I think it's fundamentally important, even further for them, that they mitigate against the risks of the electromagnetic radiation and minimize the exposure. Tell me about these little people and how important it is to stop this radiation and why are they so much more susceptible to electromagnetic radiation? Yeah, it's a combination of things. If you look at, let's say, the youngest uh, child you can have is uh, an unborn fetus, the effects on, on, on fetuses is not looking good. We have several large uh, human studies where we have followed uh, pregnant women, there's, I think there's five to seven replications of these cohorts in the last decade. It's quite substantial, where women who expose themselves to more cell phone signal during their pregnancy to their unborn child, their child had more, uh, basically, they, they, they were more likely to develop ADHD, ADD-like symptoms, or even asthma. So in other words, Maybe it suppressed their immune system or changed something in their biology uh, when uh, they, they reach a certain age. By, by age six, I think, they were followed or something like that, in early days. So that's concerning enough so that uh, even mainstream, very mainstream scientists, you've got Hugh Taylor from Yale who says, 
he, he basically says he's extremely concerned because the rat studies show the same thing in in basically uh, pregnant uh, rats or mice and their offspring. Same thing, same ADD, ADHD kind of uh, symptoms. We see that in the global population where children are more ADD, ADHD, and more asthma and, and weaker immune systems and more allergy and more to immunity. So it does correlate with what we're seeing in real life. And there's certainly it's certainly a contributor to the poor health of our children. And in, in the US, they it's it's one of the worst examples. So and I have to unfortunately use it, but uh, some researchers think that this generation of children that are born today will uh, will have a lower uh, lifespan or health span than their, than their parents. So in other words, we're going backwards for the first time in history instead of going forward in, in more longevity, uh, which, is, <laughs> which is ironic because Silicon Valley uh, people are all about, we're going to live to 200 years old and all of this. And I'm like, well, we got to start figuring out what is ailing our children because right now the, the main problem is that maybe they're eaten, going to live, they're going to die prematurely compared to our generation, which is horrid. So in reality, children are more impacted because their brain is still developing, because their nervous system has not uh, finished uh, maturing, for example. Uh, my, we, we know that EMS impact uh, uh, myelination in the brain and nervous system. So it might hinder the normal process. We also know that in cell studies, uh, these stem cells are more affected than any other uh, cell type the, the researchers have been able to identify. Extremely concerning when it comes to young people with a bunch of stem cells that are growing very fast. We know that the more cell replication that's happening in your body, the more risks you have. Again, children, they're replicating extremely fast because they're growing. And we also know that as far as raw exposure dangers go, we know that uh, children absorb, uh, children's bodies absorb at least twice the radiation compared to adult with similar exposures pound per pound. And that's because they have a higher water content. And this radiation, at least in the Wi-Fi or cell phone range, prefers water and will agitate water molecules, which is why we have these microwave ovens, right? So it will get absorbed into the body or prefer preferentially uh, get absorbed into children's body rather than adults. So the, the, the dangers are way more concerning for children. And unfortunately, again, there's a huge blind spot in science where the indications we do have for children are concerning enough and not a lot of new science is coming out or not nearly enough. And there's a lot of denial um, by health agencies, by World Health, uh, organi even the World Health Organization is kind of in denial. FDA, FCC, and the equivalents in Canada is, is same thing, Health Canada, same thing in South Africa. I mean, all the, all the Western countries are pretty much in denial of the problem, whereas some other governments, the island of Cyprus, certain parts of Africa, uh, France, they did something about it in children, which is very good. Poland did something, but sometimes they need so much pressure from citizens to actually do something. And Russia, like I told you about, well, all these countries are not crazy. They're taking preventative measures, and it's really the right thing to do because the science is already clear on these dangers to our youth. And um, it's it's already clear that if there's a Wi-Fi router in a classroom and it's not being used, it should be turned off. Mm -hmm. At the moment, people are binging on these signals as if they do nothing. And that's the main issue. If, if we minimized our exposure, for example, in a classroom, just by turning it around and opening the Wi-Fi router when you actually need it, well, most classrooms, they would use it one hour per day maximum. And sometimes some classrooms don't even use it, but it's just there. It's just exposing people. And the IT guy thought, well, I'm just going to keep it on. Of course, it's, it's, it's how our technology is built by default. Uh, there are certain 
routers like the Echo Wi-Fi routers by uh, um, by Dr. Uh, Rutger Schrader in uh, Netherlands that automatically fall into sleep mode when they're not in use, oh, wow. and that's tremendous. This is so it shows us two things. Uh, the guy is an engineer, right? He's an electrical engineer. He's um, he understands this stuff and he says, well, the technology is very stupid in the way it's built because why is it exposing everyone 24-7? There's no need. We can architect the technology so that all the Bluetooth sensors, all the Wi-Fi routers, even the cell phone towers, if there's no one around and it does not detect a very minute and very weak a beacon signal that's emitted by that, but a very, very weak signal basically that says, I'm here. And this is the only exposure you're getting. And when the cell phone tower, the Wi-Fi router, or any wireless apparatus hears from your cell phone, then it turns on instantly and there's no lag. So all the technology, here's a change. Here's an industry-wide change could be made, would reduce global exposure tremendously. And it's not hard to mandate. It is just, what is it, like a, a software that could be coded in six months? So a lot of changes could be done in the industry to first protect children and then use the same things to protect all citizens. But it, it's a concern. It's, it's especially a concern for me as a dad because when my child's going to go to school, I'm going to have less and less control over these exposures. And that's the main reason what you should worry or let's say focus on the most is your home. And it brings me back to the course because, again, if you look at the exterior and you're like, oh, no, cell phone towers and 5G and my kid is exposed to Wi-Fi at school and should I stop school? What can I do? It's difficult to do something about it. You can, you can start talking about it with the school principal and all these things. These steps take takes time in our day and age. So uh, what you can do about it is change your habits, your immediate habits, and how clean is your home or workplace. So, so these are really the concrete steps you can take, and they do make a difference in your cumulative exposure. If you have kids at home and you decide not to have Wi-Fi at night, well, you're really improving their how much they're exposed on an everyday basis, but the changes you make at night are way more important than during the day because of that sensitivity of the human nervous system to these signals during the night. So it's, it's I guess that's the good news of all this doom and gloom speech is, well, yes, what you can control is your sleep and uh, is your sleep and your immediate environment. And if you biohack that, if you minimize that aspect, well, you, you've already kind of, you're halfway there in a sense, and it helps. It helps a lot. Thank you, Nick. I just want to ask one more question about sort of the politics and the government. Do these government agencies and big telecoms actually know the damaging effect and hiding the data, like big tobacco and big pharma? Do they actually know what they're doing to people? But because of sort of the Western capitalistic sort of theory on, on profit before, you know, people... Uh, is that why they sort of just going ahead without even considering the damaging effects? And just listening to Dr. McCullough, you know, 5G hasn't been even tested. They're sending it out there. I mean, what type of sort of, you know, signal can you send out there or possible carcinogenic uh, agent without even testing it uh, on anyone over trials? I mean, it sounds like they know what's going on. It reminds me almost of Andrew Marino's book, Going Somewhere, where they knew there was damage from electrical you know, power lines causing, you know, these huge biological effects, but they just hid the data and they continued. Is this what's happening with big telecoms? Um, it's probably a mix. Uh, I think some people, unfortunately, are so money-driven, they're probably uh, ignoring these, if, these effects, but there's also a big culture around the no effect, uh, almost... Uh, it, it's it's a story they told themselves, really, because if you look at uh, military documents from the 1970s, uh, it's it's already clear in the U.S. the the military knew that exposure to radar was already concerning. If you look at Soviet studies from the 1970s to the 1990s, and these came out a few years ago, translated in English, you can find an entire biography, like hundreds of studies. It's seven. 
780 something. Uh, I haven't read all the studies, but I read the paper talking about the studies. And it's clear that at levels equivalent to what we're exposed to by just common exposures, uh, military personnel were already reporting problems to their health. And these are generally young people, young men mainly, that were in pretty good shape. So imagine what it's doing to people already fatigued or already in, in bad shape. So if we take these early studies, it was already clear that the damage was there. However, it's been also clear that an entire industry has formed over let's say this myth that has been created that there's no effect whatsoever. Uh, and at the moment, um, regulatory agencies basically um, copy each other and listen to each other. And one main that is called ICNRP is an international uh, consortium uh, or agency that is supposed to be independent, but all the members are, are voted by inside members. So it's a closed group where they don't allow scientists inside that group or engineers that have new ideas or that are, do not agree that this is safe. So things stay the same because the same people revolve and you know an invest uh, a group of investigative journalists called investigate europe uh 2 years ago did a, an incredible piece on icnerp and also several health agencies or uh, like the federal communication commissions in 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 the US or health canada in canada and they basically concluded that ICNRP and all these different agencies are part of what they call an industry cartel, where they control what's true, they control the narrative, and there's no effect. So it's, it's, it's tobacco science to its finest degree, where you pollute the EMF science with no effect studies, and you create the story where it's perfectly safe. You know, one of the heads of ICNRP lately said something that a, a lot of EMF scientists have, have right, I, I've called completely irresponsible. And he said, you know, we don't have studies on 5G, but it doesn't matter because it's safe. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's really it, the confirmation bias or, or the, the bias towards, no, we know it's safe, so we don't need to do studies. And I mean, it's not talking like a scientist, because in reality, there's already big indications throughout the different technologies that uh, it, it's probably a carcinogen. It might impact several aspects of human health. It's probably a very bad idea for children, probably a very bad idea for pregnancy, especially, you know, these moments in life where we're, we're at our weakest and, and more susceptible to toxins or agents that are stressful of all types. Uh, it's already very, very concerning. And the guy says, well, we, no, we should, it's already safe. We shouldn't study it. And these people have uh, great ties with industry. So the industry has really captured their regulatory world. If you ask the independent scientists, the ones that at the moment, a lot of them are struggling for, to even get funding for studies, well, there's literally more than 300 of them. That is, I mean, I would be hard-pressed to find an independent EMF scientist without any tie to the industry or who isn't paid by the government or the military who says there's no effect. Mm. Uh, I'm still trying to find one. Maybe I, I could find one and have them debate with the other ones. But one thing is clear, there is a debate. And the the story that everyone keeps hearing that everything is safe. It's a story that has been created by the industry. The real story is that it's, there's a heated and very important debate about whether these effects are present or not, and that the indications we've gotten from several major studies, including the NTP two years ago, are extremely concerning, and that the way we're rolling technology forward, 5G and 6G and infinite amount of Gs, it's irresponsible considering what we know at the moment, considering the, the early warnings we've already had. And, you know, it's, history repeats itself and it's, it's kind of uh, gets us a little bit cynical at, uh, at some point because it, the same thing has been seen with with lead and with different technology, with different toxins where, oh, lead is perfectly safe. Oh, no. In fact, it's slightly safe. Oh, no. In fact, it's slightly dangerous. And now every 10 years, the number 
of the amount of lead that's allowed in water or in food or uh, you name it, it keeps dropping and dropping and dropping to the point that eventually we realize there's no safe limit and we shouldn't use it altogether. And now we realize that 60 years down the road, oops, and people have died or we've damaged people's health. Mm -hmm. And listening to the early warnings should be a story or a lesson that we've learned. But unfortunately, the, the corporate influence is so strong at the moment that um, it's really... Yeah, it's polluting the debate in that way. And it's it's quite unfortunate that it's up to the users, people listening to this podcast, for mm. example, to kind of hear that and do something about it. And it becomes a big uh, responsibility. As a parent, it looks like everything is a carcinogen these yeah. days and everything can harm your kid and it becomes a big toll on your mental health. Like, oh my God, what do I do about it? So you, I guess you have to be aware, but not... Uh, overly uh, excessive about how much you worry about it, right? So that's a fine line, and it's 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 difficult. I I guess you need to also biohack your mental health and calm yourself down. Once you, you learn about EMS, you listen to this podcast, and you're like, "Wow, I'm not going to sleep for ten days." Well, it's taking it, taking the information in, realizing, okay, now I know better. What steps can I take? And what approach can I take to minimize my exposure? And th this is exactly why we created the course. Because in the end, people in my community, even after years, I guess in my book, I do have a lot of practical solutions, but sometimes they lack the really hand-holding necessary to kind of do the changes at home and minimize the exposure. So when I... I've been in communication with Brian Hoyer for, for more than two years. And uh, I don't know, the stars just aligned this year. I guess we were both a little bit more at home for obvious reasons with coronavirus. And we had times on our hand and we really brainstormed this summer. How can we come up with the simplest approach to minimizing all sources at home without having to invest like, I don't know, a thousand dollars for a building biologist, even though it's, it's a great investment, well, telling people you can only mitigate EMFs if you pay a thousand bucks, most people are going to, well, okay, no, I'm just going to close this podcast and be done with it. So that's why we created the course. Kind of, okay, what are the steps you can do by yourself, even without necessarily purchasing a, a very expensive EMF meter or any of that stuff? But how can you change your habits and, and reduce all the sources of electro pollution? So that's wireless, but also household electricity, magnetic fields, and even light, because we do talk about artificial light in, in the lot. Well, thank you for that. And, you know, I'm an educator and my tribe knows that the word doctor comes from the Latin docere, which means to teach. And so yourself and Brian are true teachers, true health pioneers. And, you know, I'm going to advocate this course Tell us a bit more about the practicality of the course, when it starts, how people can sign up, just the generosity that you've shown to Made to Thrive with regards to the discount that you, you've offered, and just what it entails exactly when people can commit to the course. Sure. So the course is a six-week EMF protection course. And we say EMF protection because we do believe that the way to protect yourself is to minimize sources, like we talked about in this conversation. It's called Electropollution Fix. And it starts on uh, November 9 until December 14, 2020. However, if you join at any point, there are the full replays. So if the the live version or when we give we give these uh, Zoom sessions, it's about an hour, an hour and uh, plus 15 minutes of Q&A every week for six weeks. If you cannot join in, you can always have the full recordings and video uh, and audio format and whatnot. And we have, basically, we take you through step one to the 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 end basically of mitigation so we talk about all types of emfs so we talk about the wireless but we also talk about household electricity and how to organize your workstation for example a lot of people do very simple mistakes i can name one is keeping your foot on your your computer charger or on a power bar and they don't realize it's increasing their body voltage some of that electricity is in fact stressing their biology so it's very very simple simple step-by-step uh, -step advice that you're going to get in this course. We don't spend a lot of time on EMF science. We could, I mean, there's so many studies. We could do an entire course of 50 hours on EMF science, but that's not the course. It is an, an applied 
uh, very uh, rational, down to earth in how to apply this information and also information on how can you get your household on board? Because that's a main issue that Brian has been seeing. He's done, so a little bit of background about Brian, the co-teacher, he's an EMF uh, mitigation specialist. So he goes into families' homes, families like yours, and he finds these EMFs and he, he, he comes up with solutions. And he often sees that sometimes is the man, sometimes is the woman or one mm. of the spouses or the kids that are, aren't really on board with that EMF thing. And they're like, well, don't take away my technologies. I love my Wi-Fi and don't do that. So there are strategies to use to get the family on board without being too upfront about it or, um, or, or creating a fight in your household. So that's, I guess, the, the very human aspect also of EMF mitigation, where how can you get everyone on board and how can you make it a cool, healthy family project in, instead of trying to fight that uphill battle with people that are skeptical in your household? So if you want to subscribe, basically, we created the special link. Normally, the, the course is $99 uh, in uh, USD money, and uh, you can get uh, $20 off. So that's uh, the, the cool deal we organized for the Made to Drive uh, uh, crew listening to that. Uh, so basically, the, the link is theemfguy.com slash thrive, and you can use the code MTT. 20 so made to drive 20 mtt20 for 20 dollar off and that's all in caps but if you go to the emfguy.com slash drive you're automatically going to see that uh if you add the course to your cart you're going to see the coupon code uh and basically the registrations close on november 6 if you miss this time around that's all right and we're going to have new additions in 2021 we're always improving the course but what is great and what people have found very valuable to take the course and try to participate live we have a facebook group people help each other people encourage each other so it becomes a, a community of families like yours that are trying to figure it out and uh, who share wins some people have said yes my husband wants to change the light bulbs now i'm going to have a better light spectrum at night and uh, less EMFs and whatnot. So it's it, it's a great community. People support each other. And that's also part of the experience of Electropollution Fix. Great. Sounds incredible. And uh, as I said earlier in the podcast, I have started the previous course that you guys put through. So that's been really informative. Uh, we do have two EMF consultants, myself and Peter Stutz in Cape Town, who've done many home assessments around the country to mitigate these risks, to come into homes, to educate, to inspire and empower people to take action, to actually stop this very invisible enemy that's causing really detrimental effects to humanity and uh, even to our animals. You know, I see, you know, I've got a few mm -hmm. colleagues, veterinarians who say that, you know, animals are getting sicker and sicker and it's because of, you know, the toxic blue lights and this radiation that's going on again and again that the animals haven't been exposed to for for thousands of years. So thanks for that. I look forward to that course. So we're probably going to have to do the recordings based on the time, but that's fine. We're here in South Africa, and I think there's a difference of probably about, it's uh, now half past eight, uh, probably about eight, nine hour difference to, to or six hours to the EST. So it'll, it'll be times that possibly people won't be able to do live, but that's fine. The Facebook group I found very sort of uh, helpful and, and just the, uh, the connections that you can make worldwide to help each other. We do need a community that can help each other. Mm -hmm. I remember doing a podcast with James Maskell from the Community Cure. And, you know, he quotes Dr. Mark Harmon. And Dr. Mark Harmon said this, the greatest force to bring about change is community. And I think that's where yes. you've got to stick together and grow together and believe in one another to institute this change. Just some closing questions that I ask all my guests, uh, and Nick, because you've been... I know you've written nutritional books and we didn't get into your backstory, but I'm sure there's going to be time at a later stage to do that. But if you had to recommend or give advice on tips or hacks to maintain people's sustained transformation, in other words, people put things in place, they start things, maybe they put their phone on airplane mode or they get tired afterwards, or maybe they stop eating junk food, but three months later they start eating it again. You know, the research and science is emphatic that you know, 80 to 95% of people who lose weight regain that weight and even more within three months and definitely within five years. So 
How can you help people sustain the transformation that they put in place? That's a very, very good question. It, it, it really depends on what your main issue is, but I, I think you, you can use technology to remind you to get off technology. Uh, you know, Apple did something very cool for the screen time, you know, uh, lately out of probably community pressure a little bit because people are too much on their phones. So even Apple itself had to recognize, okay, users need to have a kind of weekly reminder of how much time you spent on your phone. So that's great. If you find yourself forgetting to put your phone on airplane mode, well, maybe at 9.30, put an alarm clock on and remind yourself airplane mode. Okay, cool. Perfect. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly. That's a tricky question, but, um, I would say try to try to do an experiment for a week and these action steps, very simple. You don't even have to take the course, just get everything that could be wireless off of the bedroom, out of the bedroom for a week and see if you sleep better. Because I think that change can come more easily when you feel benefits and that's just a human thing to do uh if if i use a new supplement i don't feel nothing of a difference maybe i'll be tempted okay i won't buy a next bottle maybe the 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 long-term benefits are tremendous but we all think a little bit short term in that in that sense. So if you feel the benefits, or if someone in your household, even your spouse, starts saying, "Well, I don't know what happens this year, this this week. I feel so relaxed and I slept better." And maybe you don't even tell them about the experiment. Can I put their phone on airplane mode in secret? Or I don't know. You can do that just just as a cool experiment. And if they they feel the difference, maybe they're gonna say, "Oh, wait." maybe we should do more of that because who needs more stress or uh, sleep of less co- less quality in their life most people don't get enough sleep or enough quality so i'd say try to focus on that first experiment and see if you can feel a difference and if you cannot see a difference well just just try just try to be to be aware of when you're on the phone or where, when you're on Wi-Fi, do you feel different? And um, that's something I had to realize myself. And eventually I realized, you know what, I'm, I'm really foggy when I'm on Wi-Fi. And when I'm in certain places in the world, I can have an Ethernet cable, I'm way better. But it takes, it takes time to, to start developing that realization. So I think that, yes, doing the changes, but also... Uh, you can journal about the changes and that's something I would recommend for any biohack per se kind of, okay, well I did that. And now I think I, I think I sleep better or maybe I'll rate my sleep every day. And I I've got an eight on 10 instead of six on 10 kind of trying to self assess, or even if you have biohacking tool, you have the aura ring like I, ha- I do and probably Steve does. There you go. <laughs> Not surprised. So if you can quantify your sleep, some people report better uh, quantified sleep. And if it takes that to to really um, make it real for you that EMS matter, well, it, it can help, you know. So put quantification on your test. And if you see a difference, it's going to encourage you to, to stick for the long run. Uh, in the end, I, I you know, for, even for my wife, it was difficult to put the phone on airplane mode while she was pregnant. And the reason is simple. It's not that she doesn't believe in uh, the harmful signals or or in my work. It's just that it wasn't a habit. So yeah. she was sometimes putting her phone in her, in her purse and the purse was right next to the belly. And it was like, ah, Jen, I don't want to kind of always be pressing you about these issues and and be annoying but did you remember to put your phone on airplane when she was like ah no shoot i didn't but nowadays it's automatic so she's doing other things and when the phone goes into her purse uh and it's it's three years later now it's airplane mode and if she doesn't do it it feels weird so i guess you have to really reach that state of habit with airplane mode and with how much you use your phone uh something that maybe if you're very distracted by your phone or a very busy individual uh, maybe you're going to discover benefits outside of the radiation itself but maybe if you put it on airplane mode you'll have fewer texts 
uh, you'll have fewer distractions and you might find yourself saying, wow, my productivity has increased. Or maybe uh, just my overall, my overall health or um, feeling of energy because it's, it's very distracting. It's a lot of energy that we're bzz, 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 always the social media stuff popping up and people who still have alerts or even little dings every time there's a notification on Facebook. I don't know how they do it. Like I, I get crazy when I hear that, but that's because for me, it's very bizarre. For them, it becomes uh, an everyday reality. So when you change your habits, be very... Uh, in tune with how much it has uh, changed your life. And you, you, you might just decide to stick with it because now people cannot call you. It's, it's, very, yeah. it, it's a very big benefit also because you, you don't get as distracted. Yeah, well, I think uh, just in summary, self-awareness is so key. Yes. To be self-aware and to be mindful of what you're feeling. Then self-quantification, quantifying these things. You know, Peter Drucker says, what you can measure, you can manage. I think that is really, really important because we've all got blind spots. We all don't want to admit certain things, but when the numbers and the data show how beneficial it is to mitigate against these sort of fields, I think that's important. And then make uh, healthy habits. You know, I'm reading a book called Atomic Habits by James Clear. Fantastic book, over a million copies sold. Just how to build these habits into place. It Mm. takes time. It takes work to develop them, and it's got to be built on a foundation of purpose. So I think that's incredible. Just in closing, Nick Pinot's top three biohacks, give it to us uh, as clear as you can. What can you tell the biohacking community of South Africa? Number one, molecular hydrogen. <laughs> I love okay. it. Uh, the latest uh, products that I've been recommending is Drink HRW. Uh, Alex Tarvana is the inventor of the tablet. Um, there are other good brands out there, but that's one that I've come to recommend. And I've had had him on my podcast. The main reason I'm saying this is the main benefit I'm getting in my life is incredible workouts, a lot of uh, muscle endurance, and it just makes my workouts more enjoyable. It just feels like I'm not as fatigued after afterwards, and I'm I'm putting the effort in, and it's almost fun to struggle, and it's a the, the, this flow state that I that I can reach, and I do like strength based workouts, and I really love lifting heavy. So it's it, I just love molecular hydrogen for that. Uh, what else? I mean, uh, essential oils lately have been big for me. Uh, I wasn't a, a big user or anything, but my friend Jody uh, Sternoff Cohen from uh, she did the the Parasympathetic Summit, and I'm a guy that yeah I drink coffee and I'm a little bit hyped and uh, I used her, her oil parasympathetic right here like uh, near near the mastoid bone uh, be, behind the ear and I started digesting super well and I'm calmer and I'm I was very impressed by the fact that after two days I saw a tremendous difference with essential oil so I don't have a herb brand is vibrant blue oils, but I just happened to have to receive a couple of bottles. But I think this experience has really shifted my understanding on essential oils, and I'll be using more of those for different purposes. Kind of getting back in those after a few years of not using them. Um, and aside from that, I would say red light therapy. Um, I used the uh, photobiomodulation uh, for since this year and found tremendous benefits. My entire health has improved. And I think part of the reason is that really hormonal status, very, very uh, stable as far as uh, libido and strength gains go. So I think my testosterone is probably, well, I'm, I'm waiting for my organic acids uh, urine test. So we're going to see if it's really good, mm-hmm. but I feel good. Uh, and, and red light therapy has been a habit. I, I do it every other day. And I have um, one device from uh, EMR Tech it's called a fire wave. That's, that's a good one. It's very low in non-native EMFs. Uh, that's one we recommend in the course, but other ones also, also do a good job. I mean, there's a lot of different and probably a lot of different that you recommend. Yeah. So it's just something to try, especially as we get into the winter. I think it's going to really help me this winter when it's super cold. It's a, it's a combo um, near infrared slash 
red light therapy device and it just feels great like my my kid is taking his bath and i'm doing the red light therapy right next to him and he's like yeah put the red light on like he, he, lo- he loves it it's like a fun activity yeah. like and if i don't put the red light now he's getting annoyed like no where's the red light <laughs> so make it make it a an, an habit it's very uh a kind of meditative state that i that i reach is very calming i don't know i just very, I, I love it, and I and I wish I had purchased a device a few years back when I first heard about the technology. I really underestimated how much of a difference it would make for me. Great. So molecular hydrogen, then we've got essential oils, and then photobiomodulation. Just a little tip yes. from the the young South African biohacker Brian Hoyer developed the sauna space, the Faraday, you know, infrared mm-hmm. sauna. Incredible yep. product. I've got it right here. Uh, sauna and uh, this um, incandescent infrared has been and zero EMF has been incredible for my health. It's my number one biohack. I've got my four-year-old daughter in there. I've got my six-year-old son in there. I've got my wife in there. I'm in there. I've seen huge gains in my health. And uh, we've been just away recently down to the mountains. And it was only four days away, but I noticed a significant change not having my infrared sauna. And maybe that's Mm. because I live in a city in a city but to this yeah. wonderful educator nick pano you're a hero in my eyes you've got an incredible book called the non foil guide to emfs fantastic course that he's going to be presenting that's going to be recorded so even if you don't catch it live here in south africa and africa it's going to be recorded i highly recommend it i'm part of the facebook group i've learned a lot already this man is a true pioneer and he's putting a stake in the ground to fight this incredible fight and i'm so grateful to you I'm so grateful to you that you put out your name there to say no more to this, you know, this pervasive enemy that has affected so many people. So thank you, Nick Pino, the EMF guy. He's world-renowned. People know him all over the world. And uh, just thank you so much for your time. Look forward to partnering with you, Nick. I look forward to just spreading the word with you. And uh, I must say you're very, very inspiring. And uh, thank you so much. Thanks, Steve. Well, the the pleasure is mine. And thank you so much for this great conversation. Thanks for spreading the word. And you're doing so much in a a community in in South Africa where I bet, I can bet that it's less known, all all these topics. So you're a pioneer as well. And uh, and so are people in their local community where people are going (laughs) to, people are going to look at them weirdly when they hear about, oh, EMS, what is that? And some people have heard about 5G though. So, you know, this year has been bizarre for everyone and controversial and politicized, but I think it's getting somewhere. If people are, have at least heard about 5G, most people don't like the idea of a cell phone tower. So do have these conversations and you can become a pioneer too in your own community. Thanks so much, Nick.